Um, hi, welcome everyone to Stoplight Deep Dive. Um, this is just a continuation of our webinars that we've been holding, the one-on-ones that have been going abstract into what Stoplight can do. And th this time around, we're gonna be uh, diving a little deeper into uh, Stoplight, Stoplight platform capabilities, and how you can implement the API design for first workflow with that. So, <clears throat> Uh, just before we start, I'll give you a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, this webinar is um, going to be very hands um, hands down um, hands down um, demo of how Stoplight can be used to perform um, API design first. What capabilities act um, are helpful at what part of the lifecycle, and how different roles can use it. So just as an introduction, I'm the man. Um, I've been in the API space for around five years now, um, talking about API tooling, building them, using them. And um, I recently joined Stoplight, uh, mostly because uh, of what Stoplight has been um, advocating for for years now. And it's, this is something very close to me, which is the API design first workflow and which is how we're gonna be talking about today. So I'm going to be going a little bit into what API design first is. And um, from there on, I'll just um, demo through the whole workflow using Studio, workspaces, top eight workspaces, mocking, documentation, how do you review designs, how do you uh, lend designs. And eventually we're gonna end up with, um, end with um, a Q&A. Uh, so if you have questions right now or in the middle, drop them in the Q&A uh, Q section and I'll answer them as soon as I'm done with my demo. Okay, so <clears throat> before I dive uh, into what design first is, just a bit of background on why, uh, why design first. So um, APIs have been here forever. Um, it's been, um, and at the start, they weren't uh, as important to businesses. <clears throat> they were, um, companies were building lesser APIs and um, they were just fancy additions to uh, primary services. Uh, today, um, in today's world, there are hundreds and thousands of APIs. Um, APIs run billions of dollars of businesses and uh, <clears throat> companies are practically running on them. So while API, uh, the API space and the, how, the importance of APIs has grown a lot, the development practices haven't really um, taken um, taken up in that way. So you are, we're building hundreds of thousands of APIs, but uh, the strategies that we're using uh, result in redundancies, result in duplicate uh, APIs will bring bad developer experience, especially in a competitive world where you have the likes of Twilio and Stripe building APIs. Um, a bad developer experience uh, mostly results in uh, your API and the investment going into it down the drain. So Stoplight has been advocating for a design first workflow and it's been taken up by a lot of companies. Just getting into it a little bit as to what the design first workflow is. <clears throat> Traditionally, we had a code first workflow where um, people would just jump right into writing code for their APIs. So there wouldn't be that much emphasis on the design phase creating open APIs or a contract of that for that matter. They just um, write code and then eventually sometimes generate a description out of it, which results in one, a lot of time before you can get feedback on any of this. And two, a lot of inconsistencies and um, it's not really scalable, especially when you're building a large number of APIs. Like in the product world, we're now creating mockups, creating prototypes, getting feedback first, lean development, all of them have really um, taken a lot of popularity. So, uh, so is happening in the API space. Um, the design first workflow talks about first planning out what the API is gonna be doing. So really thinking about what your user requirements are, who your audience is. And then before jumping into code, creating an API contract that your developers, your consumers all agree on so that we have a source of truth, uh, which can eventually result in mock servers being created, code being generated, uh, your code being tested against the API spec to make sure you're following it. Um, and <clears throat> all of this leads to one, a lot of uh, early feedback. So we have a lot of advantages to design first itself. You will get rapid feedback, so you won't be waiting the whole development life cycle before actually um, getting um, some 
uh, getting insights into if this API is actually useful for your customers. You'll be building some things that are customer centric. You'd reuse and uh, be consistent with APIs across your organization. And I think one of the biggest ones is um, you won't be waiting for development to start while your API is being built. You can start as soon as your contract's done, your front end, your back end developers, all of them can start, uh, get in and start developing. And finally, with all this, the consistency, um, the feedback, you'd have a great developer experience, which is so important in a competitive landscape like ours. <clears throat> all right. So I'll just get in, get right into it and walk you through how we think currently you can um, achieve the design first workflow with Stoplight. <clears throat> so I'll just start off with my workspace. Um, so for anybody who doesn't have an idea on what a workspace is, um, just a bit of a primary workspace is um, home for all your internal and external APIs. You can bring in your team members, external collaborators. <clears throat> and uh, collaborate on API design and documentation. So that uh, one, um, you're building APIs that are consistent to, um, to it's a source of truth and it really drives your design first workflow. Um, and how Stoplight does that is with a close um, integration with Git providers. So the first step would be to connect your Git provider, be it Bitbucket, Bit, uh, GitLab, GitHub. <clears throat> In my case, I've already connected a, a my GitHub and imported a few of my APIs that I had. <clears throat> Today, what, I'm, what we're gonna be doing is uh, creating a to-do API. And for that, what I'll be doing is I'll be switching between different roles. So say a product manager, a designer, a developer, and eventually a docs consumer, and just walking um, through how each of these roles, one fits into the design first workflow, and two, how uh, Stoplight tooling can help each of them uh, do their job better. <clears throat> so let's just get right into it. Uh, I already have a Git repository that I created and say I'm a product manager who got this requirement to create a to-do API. The first thing, even before jumping into my design or creating open APIs, I want a requirements documentation to be created. Uh, so for what I've done here is not a great example. It's not um, uh, detailed at all, but it just gives an idea on what you need to be thinking about before getting into design. So the why of the API, the user stories. So in our case, we want to create a task, update them, delete them. I've created a data model. This can be done on the design phase too, but um, just giving this gives designers and developers a good start on designing the API so that they can create the API around it and have some guardrails as to what data has been used. Finally, there's a wireframe in there. Again, just an example I took up, but um, it gives designers good perspective on how this is going to be eventually used so that um, they can uh, take that into account while designing the API. Again, the mantra being that we need to be focusing on the consumer and what they are trying to do with it and not focusing on what technologies we're using or uh, how we're building the API, not thinking in get, get requests and put requests and more in the user stories. So <clears throat> with this ready, um, I'll assign it to my designer to go in and start creating the open API design. For that, the designer would come into the uh, workspace, look at this um, requirements document and go into studio. <clears throat> now, once the uh, designer is in studio, uh, the Git workflow would start to become clearer to you. What I do here is, as a designer, I'd create a new branch, which could be, say, the design branch. Much like your Git development workflow, where we deal in branches and then create pull requests, approve them, We'll be following a similar workflow here. So I create the <coughs> create the um, uh, branch, just let it come out uh, for a second. Um, what we're to, trying to do next here is to create an API now. So I'll just go ahead, name it <coughs> to do the API and let's get right into it. So the first thing that I'm looking to do here is give it a human friendly name I can open up the, I can use the charter to get the description. So this would be easy for me. The next next up we have server. So this is where your production testing sandbox environment would go. Right now we don't have a developed API against this. So we'll just keep it as local host. 
Um, next, what I want to do is add a security scheme to it. Now, here's where, um, as a designer, I would consider that I should be consistent across my organization. So I keep my workspace open right here, go into Explorer and see what my other APIs are doing. So I have a pet store API here and it's using an API key with header and the camel case, um, uh, camel case name. So I think I should be doing the same because when developers are using different APIs in my organization, consistency really matters. So I'll just go in and name it. So camel case, create a header, and I'll add it as a global security so that uh, all of my endpoints are secure. I can do it on a path level too if that's the use case. The next thing that I have is contact and license. This information is useful, especially if you're building an external API, but even as an internal uh, consumer, knowing who's maintaining this API, what the license looks like is important, but we'll skip it for now. <clears throat> the next step is to create a model. Stoplight creates some examples here that um, help people get started, but I'll just delete them so that we can start from scratch. So let's create a model first. We'll name it to do's and thanks to the product manager who actually created the data model, I can copy this. And using a nice little feature of Stoplight here, I can, from an example, generate the schema. So I'll generate this. Now I have a model that um, has all the fields that are required. Uh, some of these are, dates that I can look at. I'll go into additional properties. These additional properties matter, one, for good documentation, two, for developers knowing what the guardrails look like on each field. So for this one, I'll just choose a format as date time. So we know what kind of data this field look would be. We do them for all of them. So this model looks good to me now. Now, the next thing that we need to do is create a path. Uh, in this case, again, I'll go to my workspace and see how the naming looks like in my organization. So from what I see, we are using tools as the resource name and then camel case for parameters. So I'll do something similar in my path and go in and create a to-do's endpoint. So the first one that I want to do is list to-do's, which is get all the, get the list of all to-do's. Um, I will go ahead and add a small description to it. The next thing that I want to do is it should return a response, which is an array of to-dos. So I'll do that. Perfect. Um, considering this is a list, I'd also want to create a query param for pagination. From the requirements, I know this is um, this is a API that would be used in a mobile and a web application. So creating a query param, but what I'll do is I'll create a query param as a shared parameter so that I can reuse it across my endpoints. So for that, I'll create a query param here by the name of limit. <laughs> Give it a description. Descriptions are important even if you're the designer because technical writers can come in and build up on them. So just to give them an idea of what this is all about. Um, I'll go in, add a query param, and to reference shared parameters, all I have to do is choose in this project. I have already created a limits parameter. So this should now be reusable across different endpoints. Now, the next step that I want to do is um, add errors. Uh, and for that, um, again, going to my uh, explorer and seeing how, if I already have an error model that I can reuse, I do. Um, Eventually with Stoplight, what we want to do is we can reuse models across projects, but right now you can do it inside a project. So what we'll do is we'll export this and create a reusable model on the global level. Let's call it error. And I can just paste the code that I just exported so that it's standard across my organization. Now I have an errors object. <clears throat> And I want to create a response for 401, an error response. And I'd probably be using it across all my endpoints. So again, I'll create a shared response, call it 401. Uh, put it in the description again. And ref reference the model that we just created on the global level. So you can reference any models that are inside the project. I've created that. Now I'll go in and add a 401 response, which is the unauthorized response. 
And here I can choose the shared response that I just created. This can be used across different endpoints again. Now, I think this, um, this looks good to me. The next thing that I um, need to create as a post request, I'll go and create a post operation and give it a, again, a human friendly name and a description. <clears throat> All right. So the next thing that we want to do with a post request is add a body and we want to send the to-dos that we need to create. So I'll just choose this. Once I do this, what I see on the right is it's sending all the fields, but for the request, all I need is the name and the completed field. The rest are just for the response. Now what I could end up doing is creating a duplicate model, which would, um, which would result one in something that is hard to maintain and um, updating this them would be hard. But God bless Open API one and two now Studio supports that. I can go into the reduce module and uh, just the fields that I don't want in the request, I can set them as read only. I can go and set them as write only if I just need them in the request. Uh, but for this, we'll just set the fields that we don't want as read only. And now if we go and look at the post request in the request body, what we're seeing is just the name and the completed. Uh, field. Um, I'll add the response, which is again going to be a uh, to-do model. In the response, it's still the six fields. So I've reused the same model just by setting um, setting a field and uh, we're good on both the request and the response. Uh, now I'll set a 401 response that we created, the shared one. Now, Ahead of this, I can probably skip a lot of this, but uh, I want to show you how fast it gets once you've created these reusable models to create APIs in uh, Studio. So I'll just go ahead and create the other endpoints too. <laughs> so we, for this, we also need a header and uh, that's a content type header. So what I'll do is I'll create a shared header parameter here, which again, the naming needs to be consistent. So I'm Sticking with camel case on the naming of the files at least. And once I go back to the post request, I can add a header, which is a shared one for content type. Um, all right, we'll just create a couple more endpoints. So we have a to do's. ID, which is basically getting a single to-do task um, and all it needs is a response. So considering I've created all these models, it's as easy as just selecting some of these fields and we should be good to go. I'll just add a description. So, okay. And the next one that we need is an update one. So I'll just also add that. And I'll choose model. Again, you'll see that uh, it just shows the two fields that I need in the request. And for the response, it's going to be a 201. And we're gonna return the model. <laughs> awesome. So we've created the four, um, uh, four endpoints that we needed. Uh, the, as a designer, I think I should be good with my designs, but um, if I notice on the right, there's a problem section that at least points me towards something. Once I open this up, um, a little bit of context on this, this is uh, stoplights automatic linting. For, so as your, as your designer is designing open APIs, a style guide's validating if they're doing the right things. This is against the default set of rules, but what it's telling us is that we're missing one, the tags. Now, what are the tags? <clears throat> the tags would group your endpoints in your documentation and they're pretty useful. Otherwise your documentation would be a little messy. So once I add a tag, you see that um, the problems in the right start to go away. I can do that for all of them. And this one. Awesome. Uh, the, others that, uh, the other rule that I see here is that description should be on all objects. Again, useful because uh, once technical writers are writing documentation, just having a small description is useful. <clears throat> but this is just like the start of what Spectre can do. 
uh, this gets so much powerful if you go into uh, this add option and create a style guide. Uh, we're using Open API Spec 3, so we're going to create one for that. And what we can do here is say I want all my um, all my technical writers to always write description. So I change the description warning to an error. And uh, in this case, it will show up as an error. You can also change it to an info if, it's, if you don't care about it that much. But um, this is um, these are just like the default rules that we have. You can also go ahead and create um, custom rules. Now, creating custom rules, there's documentation for that in our um, in our um, in our documentations uh, on how to create spectral rules. But I'll just I have created a few that I'll just copy here to show what the power of these rule sets are. All right. So you can create all kinds of rules. What I have here is say you want to follow always follow semantic versioning. Um, your schema names should always be Pascal case. Uh, and when I go to the API, uh, now I should be seeing errors against that style guide too. Like I'm not following a semantic version. So I'll just go ahead and fix that. <clears throat> awesome. So the power of these uh, rules really comes where before this, I was actually going into my workspace seeing if I'm naming things right. Um, as things scale, that um, that process doesn't scale as well as say an automatic library where you create a style guide, your governance team manages that. And that style guide is applied across all APIs. So all your APIs would have the right naming conventions. They'd have good documentation. You can make these style guides to follow any um, level of um, rules that you make. Plus the severity really helps because some of these rules are really opinionated. Uh, so some teams might not want to follow them. So you can create them as warnings and then post just to push them towards doing the right thing. <clears throat> okay, with this ready, what I can do next is create a uh, commit this so that we can go into the re review phase of the API design. <clears throat> Once I push this, um, I should be, I'll go to GitHub and what I see here is that I have made some changes. I'll say this is my first iteration. I'm not good at commit messages, so don't judge me on that. But um, once I create a pull request, uh, what, what will happen in Stoplight is that the workspace would then have that particular pull request right there um, for for people to review. What I will do here is with the pull request, I'll copy this um, copy this link and paste it there so that anybody who I assign as a reviewer can easily go to the stoplight documentation, see if their design works and then comment on it. All right, so uh, while I don't have reviewers here, what you'd want to do is our product managers, developers, whoever, who are the, are the stakeholders as reviewers for your design. Um, and they go to the documentation and they see if this document, this design works for them. So I, as a product manager, come in and see, okay, um, I have the right endpoints here. I can enable mocking and see, okay, help me there, and see if the response looks good to me. So this follows the data model that I created at the start. There's a pagination thing. So all looks good to me, but what I spot is that there's a delete uh, function that's actually missing. So I can go to GitHub and say, and comment, which is basically pretty much exactly how uh, a Git development workflow would look like. Uh, I'd comment here. And um, if we had the reviewers mechanism here, you'd ask for changes and the designer would then come in and see, okay, there's some changes that I need to make the comments and they'd go back into studio. They'd want to create a delete operation. Uh, let's say it's delete to do and we add a ref. All right, so we're good on this. We resolve the comment that the product manager made and other stakeholders that could be a large number of them. Um, and we go back to 
go back to GitHub, come uh, review, um, ask for a review again, and the product manager goes and sees that we have the island tag it. So this is what tags do. Tags would have put it, uh, put it inside their hair. So they see that the delete uh, parameters in there too. It's good to go, and you'd merge the pull request. So this would be the product manager merging the pull request. Now this is the first phase of our um, design life cycle complete, where um, the product manager created the requirements, the designer came in, created the open API, made some, um, we made some reviews. And uh, the great thing was we didn't have to wait till the API was developed to get some reviews. Uh, we got it as soon as the open API was ready. Now with this, uh, with this ready, we'll move on to the development phase of the API lifecycle. Now we have a couple of types of developers. There are front-end developers and back-end developers. Normally the front-end developers would wait for uh, the whole API to be developed, the code to be written and to be published. And then they'd actually come in and start developing the clients. In this case, what they can do is, so say I'm the front-end developer now. I come into the documentation, go into the mocking tab, click enable mocking, um, put an um, API key and see, okay, this is how it looks like now I need to implement this. I go into code generation. I'm a web developer, I need some JavaScript code. I'll choose that, copy this, and I'm now good to go and uh, start developing um, my front-end um, website against this API, even though it hasn't been developed. Well, the backend developer would come in and see this documentation and start implementing it against it. Now, one question that arises is that what would happen, or how would you validate the developed API against uh, the contract that has been created. So even though Stoplight's workspace doesn't have support for it, our open source project Prism has, um, has a mode called proxy where developers can actually call those mock, um, mock endpoints and uh, see if their developed API actually uh, conforms to the spec, the open API spec that we just created. So what we're doing here is we're par uh, in parallel developing both the front end and the back end of the API. Um, while the API still is not developed, which is, um, which is much faster than the traditional approach. Now, another thing that needs to happen with this is that this documentation is certainly not good, good enough, especially for an external API. So the technical writer would come in while the API is being developed and the front end clients are being written and they'd start to, uh, sorry. they'd create another branch called v1 docs. So it's again the design, work, um, sorry, the Git workflow where I'd create a branch for documentation. <clears throat> and what I need to do next is one, probably add a lot more descriptions here and we support Markdown for that. Uh, but um, I'll be coming in here and adding some getting started guides and uh, other pieces that need to be added. Just to show some examples, I'll add a getting started guide. And here's a small getting started that I just copied. So, and there's terms and conditions, we need guides, tutorials. We actually are coming up with a documentation checklist, which would give you all the things that should go into a good documentation. There are good examples out there, certainly. Uh, so this is um, me writing some articles. Then I'd probably go in, update some of these descriptions to use Markdown uh, and explain it more as a technical writer. Once I'm done, I'll create a pull request and say, uh, docs iteration and push this. Now this would go again through the same workflow that we did with the, the development part. And once this is created, I should go back as a technical writer create the pull request and have people who should review my documentation review it. So it could be product managers, it could be architects or uh, anybody in the uh, API team. Uh, once they think it looks good, which they'd follow the same principle of going to the workspace and seeing if um, the documentation looks good, if it's done right. So one thing that I see here is that the requirements piece shouldn't be here. 
So there's a table of contents um, feature in Stoplight, which you can use to remove this, you can restructure this, but that's probably for another webinar. But uh, once this review part is done, we have the documentation ready. Uh, we have the design ready. The next step would be in this, probably in this time frame, we'd have uh, the developed API too, which should be as easy as just going into the API overview. And now as a developer, I probably pushed my code, I deployed my API and it sits, as, sits at <clears throat> todos.stoplight.io. So I'll update this and push this. So um, all I did was from the local host, now I've actually changed it to the um, URL that actually the API is hosted at. I'll go ahead and create a pull request. Okay. It has to happen sometimes, and uh, there was very uh, it was the wrong branch. Well, I'll update the URL, merge it in, and now we have an API that has a front-end client developed, a docs docs written, the design was reviewed, it's uh, in there, and we can. We're I think we're ready for it to go public. So what we'll do is uh, we'll go into settings. We we'll, Go into manage access, and there are three options. If it's an internal API, which it's, it's set to right now, um, it will just be available for um, people who are part of the workspace. We can make it public because I think um, it's good to go. Uh, we designed it, we developed it, and uh, we've added good documentation. Uh, we can also go ahead and make some changes to the theme. So just so that it fits our, fits our branding, we can change what the home home, pay, home screen markdown looks like. So the landing page itself, this one. And once this is done, um, this workspace that we use to create design APIs uh, is now ready for also anonymous users to view our documentations. Um, the pet store API is an internal one, so that won't be available, but the to-do API, considering it's a public API, would be available for all users to use. So, yeah. This is what I have up till now for the design workflow. We are working on um, making, bringing some of the pieces from the Git workflow into the workspace itself. But uh, if you guys have questions and uh, some of you have already posted them there, um, I'll now start answering them. All right, so, um, I see just one question right now, which is about um, Prism and its circular dependencies. So um, while we didn't go into mocking's detail here, but uh, Prism has this limitation, at least up till now, where circular references are not supported. We are working on um, a fix for it, but we don't really have a timeline on it. But um, it's um, currently the only recommendation that I can give you is to be using um, to one, either remove those um, circular references, which sometimes is hard. Um, otherwise, um, for now, Prism can't support it, but we'll keep you updated as soon as there's something new in there. Any other questions? Well, please, if you have any, post them to the Q&A and I can answer them. All right, awesome. I think um, this was, thank you all for joining and uh, we'll be sending um, the recording of this. Plus we'll be sharing the design, um, uh, we'll be sharing a design checklist and other content that is relevant to the webinar today. So thank you so much.
Oh, um, sorry, uh, I just got the questions, um, so, John, so I'll answer them. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so currently we don't support merging branches. Merging branches is currently like I showed in the webinar. It's something that you would have to go to GitHub to do it, but that's something that we want to eventually want to get to. Right now it's a combination of creating branches and managing them in Stoplight Studio and going to um, GitHub to merge requests or um, uh, merge requests or say comment on uh, reviews. So um, the, the size of a model can slow down the UI, but that is when it gets very big. We have been working on working with very large models. So unless it's like in the order of megabytes, um, 10 or above, I think uh, the UI can handle it pretty well. Uh, for the last one, we're uh, integrating wiki pages from um, GitHub is concerned. What I'd recommend is um, currently we don't have, um, currently we don't have um, support for that in Stoplight's workspace, but uh, we have something in the cooking where an embeddable documentation might be the answer for you. So, so if you can, um, we can send you the link to that where you can sign up for an early access. What that would allow is for you to embed documentation and then have GitHub pages or any other website built around it. So that would be the answer for now in StopLight workspace. And if you're using the hosted version itself, the only way for you to go about it is to add Markdown like I showed. Sorry, I'm just catching up on the questions here. So, just a second. Okay, so to answer your question around um, once development is started using the API defined, you can't find a good way to round trip between API and downstream, um, stop it and downstream tools. Um, how we have thought out and built this as um, GitHub's a source of truth and that is what we're working with directly. So any other tools that you wanna integrate would also be working with GitHub. If, you have, if you're working on local projects somehow, that is where I think it might be a problem, but if you could build on the question, I can certainly answer them. Um, so Gabriela has question. Um, Do you recommend using open API generator to generate the backend? Um, it's um, I, it's one of the tools that you can use and certainly it can fit the workflow where for some use cases it breaks where the updates, uh, updating it uh, while the code has been written is hard, but uh, it's certainly a good tool for you to generate backend and frontend like um, client code. So, but we don't really generate server-side code, um, but you can use an open source tool like Open API tools for sure. Uh, open API generator for sure. Um, Aiden, you, uh, Aiden asked a question around if there's blog posts or other written content around API design first. So uh, actually as part of this um, uh, webinar and the email that we'll send after this, we'll share a design checklist, which is a list of 10 steps that are normally, that would normally um, explain the design first workflow, but there are certainly other blogs on our, um, uh, on our, blog, on our blog that you can't read around it because this is one of the primary values that Stoplight provides. <laughs> Uh, okay, so Andres is a question around, it's, the question is same as visualizing branches, is it possible to visualize a certain tag in a branch? Um, so we don't have that. 
right now um, we have plans around life cycle time but you can go to roadmap.stoplight.io for um uh, where future plans look like there and even add our submit ideas so that would be the way to go <laughs> um as, uh, john you asked around any eta for circular references um uh, like i said before we don't really have an eta on circular references but um the github issue that was open we'll keep it up, keep updating it as there are other updates uh, right now we're still considering um, uh, how to go about it the last question that i see is uh, from john again which says um, we type one keystroke and it takes literally minutes to reflect on the screen. Um, so uh, that might be an edge case that you are hitting. So normally studio would perform very well for examples or models. So if you could share the spec um, uh, on support.stoplight.io, uh, we can certainly help you out there and see what the problem might be. Um, I think we're done with most of the questions. Anybody else has any questions that they wanna uh, put in there that I can answer? All right, thank you so much everybody for joining in um, and uh, for the questions. I hope the webinar was useful for you. Uh, we'll, um, you can, we'll be sharing the video on the email. Um, you can register for other webinars that are um, going to be happening in the next few months. Um, and thank you so much. Um,